This episode is brought to you by Infiniline. Infiniline is an elastic belt for your beltless bottoms. Whether you're on a weight loss journey, you are a new mama trying to extend those maternity clothes, or you just feel more powerful and confident when your pants stay up, you can check out InfinilineBelts.com to learn more. Welcome to the Run Lift Mom podcast, where we're talking about running, lifting, and momming, not necessarily in that order. And today we're going to be squarely in the running and lifting category for a question and answer episode. I want to let you guys know that this is audio from an Instagram live from last week. Listeners submit questions and then I answered them live last week and now it's a podcast for you. You are going to learn about the Peloton Marathon program fueling for an ultra marathon, pacing in a race, strength training for runners, as well as grit building workouts. I hope you enjoy this. Remember, it came from a live, so the audio is going to sound slightly different. Nonetheless, I hope it's advice that you can use. Without further ado, question and answer. I'm out there. Okay, the first question, Jenny says, do you know anything about Peloton marathon training? I'm glad you asked this, Jenny. I'm glad you asked it because I actually just dove into this. So shout out to my friend, Rachel, who put this on my radar. Um, I wanted to see it from a macro level. So if you're like me and you've been up in the Peloton app, you've seen that there are training programs. There's actually a really great eight-week program that gets you ready to run. So if you're not yet a runner and you want something that's run, walk, and then eases you a little bit more into running, That is a great program, highly recommended. What happens on your app is you join the program and then instead of opening your app and looking for classes to join, they're there for you. Like for example, you would have five classes to take in a week. They would be running classes or run walk classes specific to the program that you're in. And then you kind of mark those off. They gamify it. You know, you can earn badges and whatnot. But I know that you're asking specifically about the Peloton outdoor training program. Um, I'm going to put this in the notes below. Um, Rachel gave me like a macro level view of the training program. So I was able to look at it because the problem with these Peloton programs is from the app, you can only see what you have that week. Well, as a retired running coach and just in general, as an exercise nerd, I need to see the big picture. I need to see the macro level, right? Like I can't see it week by week. And so I did get the full 18 weeks to take a peek at. And I want to give you some of my thoughts on this. First and foremost, you see these three pages? (laughs) It's 18 weeks long. It's 18 weeks long. Now, I like this because in Peloton, they split it up six, six, and six, which is really fantastic. Another thing that I adore about this program is it focuses on minutes instead of miles. So you're really looking for, like, as an example, um, week one, run number one, they always ask you to do a 10 minute warm up, And that, regardless of whether you're following Peloton or a different program, you should always warm up. So they've got you doing a 10 minute warm up, And then they've got you doing a 30 minute tempo run as your first run on week one. So let's say that you run a 10 minute mile. Now we know that that tempo run, right, is probably going to be a little bit like faster than that, that 10 minute mile, but let's just for simple math sake, right? Um, That means you're going to run four miles on that day one. You've got another 30 minute run plus that 10 minute warm up. Essentially in this first week, you've got 25 miles. So if you are a regular runner and you just want to be in a formal training routine, that's great to jump in with 25 miles. I worry, I worry that it's 18 weeks long and I worry that you're going to peak at week 14. And I think it's fantastic if you have a really great 18 mile long run here at week 14, but I don't want that to be your personal best. Let's not have a personal best on week 14, week 15, right? And so it scares me a little bit that it's 18 weeks long, but 
I do love, they incorporate strength training, they incorporate recovery. Um, I really love how this program also has you track your intention for the week, how you're feeling. They've got that data for you so you can see your fitness improving. So I think it's going to be really motivational for somebody who needs to see that tangible stuff. I also, you can, and you can always pull back. You can always skip a run or pull back. If it's me, um, you know, I would probably jump into the schedule again, being someone who pretty much races, you know, year round. Um, I think this is a really great schedule to either follow in the full 18 weeks. If you have taken a break, like you did a race and then you just took a break. And actually that's what I'm going to do for Richmond. I'm going to test the schedule out. I love the minutes versus miles thing. That means me, somebody who as a training pace, right? Like my marathon training, my marathon running pace is about eight minutes per mile. But because this is minutes, not miles, you and I, let's say that you run a six and a half minute mile. We can now follow the same plan. You are a more talented runner than I am because you can run a six and a half minute mile as your training pace. You're going to get more mileage than I am. Um, I like how it's self-limiting in that way. Do you see what I mean? So if somebody runs a 12 minute mile, right, and they're going out for that 10 minute warm up and then 30 minutes of running, their mileage is going to be different than me. And so I really like that. And in terms of one size fits all approaches, I think this is pretty darn good, guys. I think it's really, really good. Now, you know that I've got my flexible training plans as well. Um, and this one, the marathon is actually free right now. It will be for another month. You'll just need to go to my website, runliftmompod.com. You'll go over to shop, then down to digital products, and you'll see that at the checkout, the marathon training program is at zero right now. If you want to go ahead and get that, it's a 12-week training program. So this is for someone who is already conditioned. But if you want to go ahead and get that and then like, you know, blend these two, do it, my friend, do it. The marathon police are not going to come and get you. I'm going to test this one out though, because I really love it. A lot of people that I know personally and that can encourage me on the Peloton app are using it. And so I say yes uh, to the Peloton app. I'm actually, or the Peloton marathon training schedule. I'm actually going to be getting this one um, 18 week schedule. Again, this is a long, long cycle. Um, it does cycle up to 20 miles and in theory, about 45 to 55 miles per week. That's assuming you run anywhere from like an eight minute mile to a 10 minute mile. So that's your highest volume. Um, and I think as long as we're doing our strength training and our recovery and we're paying attention to our fuel and our sleep, I don't think that is too much. Um, but we have to pay attention to our body. Um, I have told a few of you, I, I got hurt over the weekend. You guys, I've been doing that. I've been doing deadlifting. Um, wow. A, you know, certified, uh, USAW trainer, you know, taught me in a CrossFit football gym. Okay. Like we did a lot of deadlifting in that gym. I've been doing this for over a decade and I got hurt on Sunday doing a deadlift. Um, and the problem was, I wasn't listening to my body. I was listening to my head. True story. You know, Pavel Sassolini says, always treat a heavy bar, treat a heavy barbell like it's light. And I was warming up. I had 165 on the bar. That was not my working weight. And when I pulled, I could feel it. Like I could feel, uh-oh, like this is too heavy for me. And do you know what happened in my head? I was like, but this is only 165. And I completed the lift like an idiot. Um, and that's going to put me back a little bit. Now I'm sharing this lifting story with you, my running friend, because if you are on this 18 week Peloton program and it says for you to do a 45 minute tempo run and your body is not feeling it, you need to skip that run. And I really love that the app gives you the ability to do that. Let's go to uh, question number two. So question number two, Claire says, I am training for an ultra marathon. Yay, Claire. Um, what about food? What about food? You guys, um, this is actually something that I can speak to with some expertise, right? They say if you can go to the middle of Times Square and you know more than most of the people there, you're an expert. I'm going to declare myself an expert here. Just kidding, but seriously. Um, I have done a number of 50 milers, 50 Ks, 100 Ks, 100 miler, and then some other ultra type events. So relays, the Goggins Challenge. Um, I will tell you first and foremost, test before the race. This is like running, running 101, running 101, test before the race. You want to um, also 
eat the normal foods that you would. Look, I know that the gels and the fizzy tablets and all this kind of stuff is super sexy. Um, and the science behind it is good. Like let's use science. I'm not one of these that says like everything needs to be a natural whole food because you guys, some of the stuff that science has created for us is really, really fantastic. And it will give us a training edge and you can either take that or not. The thing is you want to test it during your dress rehearsals and your dress rehearsals would be your long runs. And I'm using that language very specifically because I also want you to be wearing the clothes that you're going to wear. If you're going to have like a fuel pack or some sort of hydration, you need to take that out with you on your long effort that way on race day. I even like the concept of packing a drop bag on an ultra marathon course. A drop bag is where you have a bag full of full fueling supplies at different points on the course. Maybe you set up that scenario, right? Like you've got extra socks in there, you've got your fuel, whatever. Um, and so test before the race and then um, try to stick to the pattern that you normally would. And what I mean by this is I'm someone as an example, who plays around with intermittent fasting. Um, and so I would say probably five days out of the week, I'm waiting until noon, which gives me about an 18 hour fast before I eat. So for me to go out and race um, and eat a huge breakfast first thing in the morning, like all of the other racers, that makes zero sense. That is not what my body is used to. And so if I have a longer effort, like that 12 hour race that's coming up in December, what I'm gonna do is toy around with eating small breakfast on my long effort or my double effort days. That way, my, like my body is used to having some calories. <laughs> and then I'm going to find that minimum effective dose with some of our science-based supplements, which again, I, there are two schools of thought here. I am of the school of thought that everything you put in your body should not be a chemical, you know, what storm. Um, but on the other hand, like science has given us some really fantastic stuff. Um, and so if you can find that minimum effective dose to give you the edge, that is a best case scenario. Um, and so I want you to, again, think about the pattern and the timing. And no matter what you take in, whether it's fresh food fuels, so um, real type, real food. So what I mean by that is you'll see on the ultra course, um, salted potatoes are really popular. Sweet potato. I've seen runners run with sweet potatoes, okay? they they What they do is they bake them, they take the peel off, and then they just have like in a little Ziploc bag, <laughs> They will bite off the top and think of it. It's like a gel, but it's a sweet potato. I've seen the same thing with bananas, right? Like you've got a gel, but it's a real food. And it's a quick burning carbohydrate. The reason they're taking the peel off of that potato is because that's where a lot of the fiber is. And that is not something that you want on race day. And so there's a real like mental shift here, especially for ultra running where you need the quick burning carbohydrate. This is not your ticket to eat pop tarts and M&Ms and all this other stuff. You will see it at the fueling uh, stations at an ultra marathon. You can, you can have it, but make sure you've tested with it at your dress rehearsal during your long runs. Make sure you've tested with it. Um, I, quick burning carbohydrates. And I think this is a real mindset shift for a lot of runners because we're typically health conscious people. And so we're used to, right? High protein, leafy greens, a lot of volume. I want to be satiated. Well, that's great until race day and your body is in constant movement. And Claire did not say how long her ultra marathon was, but she said ultra marathon. So I'm assuming it's outside of that 26.2 miles. She's going to be out there five plus hours. You, you need quick burning carbohydrates. You need quick burning carbohydrates that aren't going to take your body a lot of like effort and pain to break down, right? So high protein, a lot of fiber, right? Like that's really good when we are trying to stay full, when we're trying to maybe restrict our calories or our eating or our portions, that's fantastic. When you're running though, and I'm using the word fuel, I'm using that language very specifically because that is just a totally different ball game. So I'll ask you to shift your mindset on that. Um, and then the other note that I made for you, Claire, is your, your digestion will go upside down at some point if you've got a longer race. You didn't say how long your race was, but if you think you're going to be in the eight plus hour like category, if your race is that long, <laughs> your digestion is going to go upside down. 
it will. So it is very, very important to take in, obviously, a lot of fluids, take in those calories early. Um, calories aren't like rollover minutes on a cell phone plan. Like you can't take in a huge breakfast and then expect that to work for you eight hours later. It's not going to work like that. So make sure you're taking it early and often. Um, if you are someone who fasts regularly, again, I recommend that you experiment with breakfast so your body is used to that and you can get those calories in at the beginning. Um, foods like watermelon are really great. If you start to feel your tummy going a little bit crazy, watermelon is really great because you're still getting that hydration in. It's also giving you something you know solid to eat, um, but it's not going to be so in quick burning. Quick burning carbohydrate is what we're looking for. Also, ginger is really helpful. So if it's cold during your ultra marathon, ginger tea can go a long way. Um, if it's hot, you don't want ginger tea, but you could probably do like a ginger chew is really fantastic. I get them on Amazon. Um, health food stores have them. They're just little chews that you can even have on your, your personal self somewhere. If you start to feel your tummy doing some crazy stuff, the ginger chew is great because spoiler alert, it's candy, quick burning carbohydrate. It's going to give you some calories, some fuel to burn there, but then also um, it will help settle your stomach. Carbonation is also great to settle your stomach. And so if you're able, maybe packing a can of ginger ale in your drop bag for that ultra marathon, that's a fantastic idea. Friends, if your leggings are falling down as you're running, lifting, or momming, I've got somebody you need in your life. Jen, tell me about infiniline belts. So infiniline belts are magnetically attaching belts created to keep um, primarily leggings, but also other types of beltless bottoms from falling um, during your workouts or just throughout the day, especially if you're on a weight loss journey or like me and just love to wear leggings for every occasion. I think that's all of us. All right, number three. This is three out of five questions. I'm so grateful for you guys for sending these in. Haley asked, I don't like strength training, but I know I need it as a runner. Where do I start? <laughs> Haley, girl, I love you. I love you. Okay, so I just actually did a great episode about this. I'm going to link it below. Um, it's season three, episode 53, and it's with Brody Sharp of the Run Smarter podcast. He's got a whole program, Run Smarter Online. He is an Australian physio, so you're also going to love hearing his accent. But he talked about strength training for runners. The first part of the episode is probably not news to you because you said you know you need it, but he presents a really great research-based case for runners lifting heavy, as in we see better performance from endurance runners who lift heavy. So I know runner that you love doing your body weight exercises because you're probably lean. You're probably pretty good at those body weight exercises. You need to lift heavy. And so his recommendation for runners was actually somewhere in the eight to 10 rep range. And he really emphasized proper technique there because um, you just heard about my deadlift story. Always treat a light bar like it's heavy. If your technique is off or you're fatigued, you will wreck yourself. Um, I love this episode because it's very simple, tactical advice. He recommends um, the push, pull, and squat movements. In some schools of thought, they'll add the carry. If you go to the Dan John School of Strength, I'll actually link a couple of um, articles from him. He has a renowned strength training coach. Um, and I think a lot of his advice can is well received in the running world. So uh, again, push, pull and squat exercises. So what do I mean by push? I mean, any kind of pressing exercise, shoulder, chest, whatever, pulling exercise. Um, I mean, obviously pull-ups are great. Rows are great. I love a good rope climb for a pulling exercise. Rock climbers, you're doing a lot of pulling. There are a lot of great ways to do that. And then squat, you guys know about squats um, and they're really, really important. We consider this injury proofing. And so Haley said, I know I need it. Um, you need it for injury proofing. If you want health and longevity in your running, you need it for injury proofing. My 40th birthday is next month. Yes, I'm going to be a master runner and I'm very excited about that. And I don't care if my last PR is behind me. I do not care. What I personally care about, and I think this will resonate with you, what I care about is being that 70 or 80 year old, right? Stepping up on 
stepping up to the finish line uh, or to the starting line and then the finish line. I care about being someone who is in this sport for longevity and just go to your next local 5K and look around and look at all of the older adults around you and you will see there is longevity in this sport. But I think a really important part of that equation (laughs) is that you're doing some regular strength training. And ladies, I want to speak especially to you right now. We need to worry about osteoporosis as we get older. And I don't care how much milk you drank um, from those great commercials in the 80s. There's not a lot you can do about it now, right, to fight against what naturally happens. Strength training. The research is there for strength training in building your bone strength. Um, It's just so, so important. So even if you're not a runner and you just stumbled upon this, I really want to emphasize strength training. And then um, we've got, how do I pace myself in a race? This is for Laura. Let me read Laura's full question because this is awesome. Laura says, the wheels fall off for me (laughs) in the second half of a race. How do I pace myself during a race? Laura, first and foremost, you might be going too fast. (laughs) Girl, I've been there, okay? If If the wheels just totally fall off for you in the second half, You might be going too fast and you might need to reframe what your race pace is or that target pace that you're looking for. Now, running watches are very helpful for this, whether you have a Garmin or an Apple watch. Um, Running watches are really great because you can look down and you can see your pace. For some people, that is a little bit nerve wracking. It turns an enjoyable experience, a race into something that's like, oh man, now I'm like looking at my pace every, every second. And so, um, if that's you, I recommend something like this. I got this from marathonguide.com. This is something else that I will link. Um, they've got a really great calculator there, you guys. And what you do is you just type in the time that you want. So as an example, I want a 335 in a marathon. And so this breaks down very evenly. So this is going to be even, not a negative split. A negative split would be where you do the second half faster than the first half. So this is not for a negative split. This is just for an even race. Mile one, eight, 12, mile two, 16, 24, mile three, 24, 36, and so on. You can put any ending time into their calculator and it will spit you out a piece of paper that you can print out. And I have laminated mine when I wasn't a mom and didn't have a laminator on standby. I would just take clear packing tape and kind of make it waterproof myself. And then all you're doing is taking a safety pin and you're putting this around your arm for race day. That way you can look down and just see where you are. You can do those checkpoints instead of being attached to your watch the entire time. Another thing that I want to suggest for you for pacing is to, so again, we've got to, are you, are you reaching too much? Are you going too fast? First, make sure you have the correct pace. A really great way to check on this would be to use the Macmillan running calculator. The Macmillan running calculator will allow you to input a race time that you have right now. So as an example, if you say, I know that I can run a 28 minute 5k, it will estimate your marathon pace, right? So, and you can even do like a backward check. If you're like, oh, I've never done a 5k. I'm going to do some this summer. There are a lot of opportunities. Things are opening up. I know that I run a four and a half hour marathon. You can then get that recommended 5k pace. So you can do it backward as well. But if you go to that Macmillan running calculator and just do some checks to make sure that you have the right pace first and foremost. And then maybe you're using something like a pace band. If you do a larger race, oftentimes there will be pacers. They're employed by the race. They're usually provided by you know sponsors. It's part of the race experience. And so that is a really fun and really cool thing. You get to run with a group. In a pace group, I'll let you know the culture of it is typically you'll meet up with that pacer at the expo or the morning of. They will be holding a sign in the air that says, for example, four hours or three and a half hours or four and a half hours or whatever it is. Um, This is very common at like half marathons as well. Whatever your ending time that you want is, they will be holding that, you know, um, that sign. This is not something typically that you need to sign up for. It's just a service provided by the race. You'll probably meet up with that person in the corral and all of you introverts, 
hear me when I say, you'll just need to say, yeah, I'm going to try to hang with you. My name is Susie, whatever. You don't need to like, talk. this doesn't need to be a group run. You don't need to talk to these people the entire time. Now there are, there are people that will talk with their pacer the entire time. Like they want built-in entertainment. Um, and if that's you, like if you need to run with people, that's a good thing too, right? There will always be people in the pace groups that want to make it a social thing, but there are also people that just want to keep that person in sight. And I think, um, quite honestly, Laura, I think maybe this is you. If you could just keep that pacer in sight who has the ending time that you're looking for, just keep that person in sight and then you can pace off of them. That means you don't even need a pace band. That means you don't even need your watch if you don't want to just hang with that person. And a lot of times when we get that mental exhaustion in a marathon, that's really helpful, right? Like I don't have to do math. I don't have to be looking at my watch. I don't have to do any of that stuff. I just need to make sure that this person is in sight. So um, that that is my suggestion for you. One, do some backward calculating on the McMillan calculator to make sure that you've got the right race pace and then use a tool. Use a tool like a watch, like a pace band, like a pacer provided by the race. Here is the final question. This came in at the last minute. Chrissy asked, what grit building workout can I do besides Murph? <laughs> I really appreciate this, Chrissy. And actually, when I asked for questions for this Q&A, um, it was right after I released an episode about doing Murph back in 2019 for 22 weeks in a row. So I did it from Memorial Day until Veterans Day. Um, and I did it for like, just for the purpose of doing hard things, right? Like to build grit, um, which is what, what she's alluding to. Um, and so I would, one, I think the Goggins Challenge, and that is another recent po podcast episode, the Goggins Challenge is a fantastic choice. I, I don't think there is like a, oh, you need to be this fast of a runner to do this. If you run slower, you're going to get less recovery time. Simple as that. If you can complete the, it's four miles every four hours for 48 hours. And so um, I just, I don't think there's a line in the sand. I think anybody can do it. Slower runners, you're going to get less time, but you just cover four miles. Part of it could be walking. Um, I love that one, although it does take some dedicated time. Like you're going to need two days. Um, one that my husband and I recently did, and we're going to revisit because it was just this kind of grit building workout was um, the kettlebell mile. And so I'm going to link to this as well. The kettlebell mile is something that um, someone who does a lot of self-experimenting in the strong first community wrote about. And it is there are weight prescriptions. Um, I weigh a buck 20. I use 16 kilo, um, which is about 35 pounds. And you are basically doing a farmer's carry with that heavy kettlebell for a single mile. Um, my husband carried more. We did it together. I like, it was, it was pretty tough. It was really, really tough. And I don't know that, um, wow. I, it's definitely one that builds grit. Um, when I think about it, I'm getting butterflies right now, even describing this workout. And so that lets, that lets me know this is a good grit building workout. If the workout gives you butterflies and you're a little bit afraid to do it, that is a good signal that it is a good grit building workout. So again, that is the kettlebell mile. Map out one mile. Maybe you do this on a track where you've got four 400 meters. We did an out and back. So it was a half mile out, half mile back. Um, and you now you can change hands, right? So you could carry with your right hand and then switch it over to the left. You can stop and drop the bell. Um, you can't travel. You can't gain any distance, obviously, when you stop and drop the bell. Um, I would say we've only done it once. We've only done it once. It took us about 18 minutes. Uh, if you attempt this, I would say drop drop earlier than you think you need to. We did probably the first 400 meters without, we transitioned hands, but we didn't drop the bell and give our grip a rest. And that, that was a mistake. Um, it got really, really spicy. I want to say about three quarters of a mile the way in. It was a really tough workout. It only took 18 minutes, but that is a good grit building workout. And then finally, the last one I want to present to you is a running streak. And this is something that everyone at any level can do. So a running streak is where you run one mile every day, rain or shine. <laughs> so there's an entire like 
club for this, right? There are Guinness World Records around this. Um, one of my childhood friends, her father, Ed Dupree, was famous for this. Um, he there, There's a story about Ed Dupree that he didn't want to break his streak. He worked at our local newspaper at the time. And so he mapped out, this is before the days of like watches. This is like straight up pedometer days. He mapped out a mile in his office at the Salisbury Post and <laughs> would do his mile if he was working late. Like he would run his mile indoors um, if he was working late or the weather didn't allow for it. Like he was very serious about getting that mile in. I really love that that because it's something that can be done while you do have training cycles, right? Like you're going to get that mile in anyway, but then when you're off of a training cycle, it allows you to still maintain that habit. And the reason I believe that it is a grit building exercise is because it is hard to be consistent with something consistent, like to be consistent, consistency, <laughs> that is the secret weapon. That is the secret sauce. And it's hard and it's why everybody can't do it. And so I like a running streak for a full year, 365 days. That's a grit building workout. I know it's not going to break you off at the time. It's not like the kettlebell mile where when you're done with it, you're, you know, you're laid out, sweat angel, that kind of thing. Running one mile every day is just as challenging. And for that reason, we'll build grit. Thank you so much for listening to the Run Lift Mom podcast. I want to let you know that you can swipe up in the podcast player that you're in to see the show notes. That's going to take you to my website and you're going to get a deep dive on today's show. Cool, huh? You can think of it as a blog post that complements what was covered today with all of the links and resources discussed. Don't forget to check out the podcast partners as well with some really great offers for you. And until I get into your earpiece again, remember, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That's from 1 Timothy 4.8, and this has been the Run Lift Mom Podcast.